This is I Should Be Writing Season 20, Episode 31. Hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing. This is a podcast for wannabe fiction writers, and I am your host, Mer Lafferty. And today we're welcoming back to the show author Gwen Garfinkel. First, we talked about uh, Can't Find My Way Home a little while ago, and then now you've got a new book out of an anthology of short stories, and we're going to talk about that. But welcome back to the show, Gwen. Thank you. Good to be back. Yeah. Um, so, how has th- how have things been since you your your novel came out? You know, a lot of people have a problem with like short if they do novels or novels if they do short. And you seem to you hit all the things. You've also got a novella out with uh, we 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 reprinted that in Escape Pod. So you're like a master of all the lengths. And and it's in the book as well in 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 my my uh, new collection. Oh, excellent. And in fact, that's one of the main reasons I wanted to put together this book was I really wanted it to be, to, I wanted that novelette to be in a, in a book. Mm-hmm. So I'm, so, so I'm very happy about that. But yeah, I, the past couple of years, I've most actually been working on a novel that I, I had just finished the first draft when we last spoke and now it's done and I'm trying to get a new agent. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, starting to work on a sequel for that book um trying to write a couple of short things but when I write something long it does kind of take over my life Mm -hmm. (laughs) yes it's really hard to change gears for some people and other people can do it almost effortlessly but we hate them so um Yeah. yeah I think most of the things in the collection were in fact all of them were written before I started writing the the really long novel that I just finished. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is something that hasn't been in print yet. Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, so tell us about, I, I don't know if we've helped an author promote an anthology before. So um, I know a lot of people have questions about short fiction. Um, first, let's talk about just, I know this sounds rude, but Why? <laughs> it's like back in the pulp days, they all made money and it sounded all sexy and stuff. And now it's like, it's pennies per hour, if that. And um, I just... So why why write short fiction? Yeah. Um, well, um, one thing is you can kind of get away with things you can't in long form. I mean, it, you can experiment. Um it doesn't have to go through so many, you know, people to get it published. Yeah. Um, I mean, technically it's it also takes a lot less time, but it, it takes me forever to write a lot of, sh- a lot of my short stories were not quick. Mm-hmm. Um, also, also sometimes, you know, I'll, there'll be like a cool submission call. So it'll be kind of like a prompt. It'll be like, Oh, well maybe I could write a story on that theme. And so that'll be, you know, some kind of inspiration. Um, and there was a time um, before my novel "Can't Find My Way Home" was um, accepted for publication. When I was like, you know, I'm writing these novels, no one's publishing them. You know, what it is a lot of time. You know, maybe I should focus on short things. They'll be they'll be easier for me to get published. That's kind of you know, I, there were several years when I was mostly writing short things because um, it just seemed like well, I could get them published and people would read them. <laughs> so building up. When, yeah. But then when I sold a book, I was like, oh, but I love writing novels and I will write more novels now. Yeah. And uh, I feel the need to clarify this. Like, I don't think it's a waste of time. I'm just wondering if people have that thought of why do it. Uh, Cause none of us are in this for the money. <laughs> well, I was on a panel at a, I think I think it was at ReaderCon. I think it was at ReaderCon this year, um, which was about the pressure that short story authors feel to write long form. Oh wow, yeah. And 
and apparently even Kelly Link, you know, who is like widely considered like one of the great short story writers of our time, you know, was under a lot of pressure to write a novel. And and I love her her, her novel a lot, but still, it just seems unfair to me that someone of her caliber w- would get that. Yeah, yeah. Was John Chu on that panel perchance? he may have been yeah <laughs> that's that's i've known john for a long time and he's always been an excellent short story writer and and kind of has has that sentiment about why write longer this is what i love and and do which is you know great and you know you can tell a lot of different stories when you write short you can just get that story out there um so what would you say is your so is the novelette your your or the novella your favorite piece in this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I was very proud of A Wild Patience. Um, was real happy when Escape Pod reprinted it. And I just was like, I want it in a book. <laughs> just because I really, it, I, it, I feel like it's one of the best things that I've written. So I'm happy to have that in the collection. And um, Many of the pieces in the collection were previously published, but then there were a few that that are new that I that I was not able to to get published first. And it's always it always happens. It happened with my previous collection. It's like invariably the things that were never published and that you know even that may have racked up a lot of rejections get a lot of interest <laughs> when oh, really? they finally make it into a book. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's a, a wild patience. It's in three parts um, on escapepod.org. We'll have that link in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Um, so you mentioned you are looking for a new agent. How has that uh, that search been for you? And uh, by new, I assume you had representation before. I did have representation before um, some years ago. Um, it was not easy to get an agent that time. Um, it, it is, it is a humbling experience, <laughs> um, I must say. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to go, but I, I persevere. Um, I, I do think in general, just, you know, talking to people that it, it, it get, it has gotten more difficult than when I was trying before. And when I did get an agent, it took me a long time. I think it took me about a year to get an agent the mm-hmm. first time I, when I did get one. Yeah. And it was kind of a fluky thing where she knew she knew some some things I had written. She it's like she knew a poem I'd written. Wow. She knew some of my fan fiction. So it wasn't that she loved my query letter, but she knew of me. I knew of her, but through a pseudonym, and I didn't know that I knew her. Oh, it weird. Was a different name. Anyway. Um so it's like I had things going for me with her that I didn't even know that I had going for me when I queried her. That, you just never know with yeah. these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. This is why I say, you know, be nice to everybody. Don't, don't, don't let yourself be stepped on, but just be nice to everybody because you honestly don't know who could be just like holding a editorial business card in one hand and, you know, pony flyer four four two fanfic writer in the other one. I want to talk about your fanfic. I am fascinated by authors who write fanfic. I've written a little bit, but I always feel like if I'm writing something creative, I want it to be towards publication, which of course makes me sound unfun. And yeah, I don't like the way that makes me sound because I know so many authors who just really love to delve into fan fiction. I have not written it for a number of years, um, but I went through a a brief but intense period of writing it for a few years towards the end of, of um, Buffy airing. Mm. I got super into Buffy and Buffy fandom. And I actually met a lot of friends on Live Journal who were also kind of writers starting out who are still my friends now, but That's are great. like published authors. Um, but at the time, it's like, actually, I was about to start grad school. I was about to go into an MFA program. And then I got really into writing fanfic. <laughs> and I was like spending a lot of time that I should have been, you know, working on my MFA program, like writing, writing, like novel length Buffy fanfic. Wow. Um, but it kind of, it kind of gave me back the fun. I, it's like I, the novel that I signed on with my agent for was something, was a vampire novel 
that like I I guarantee I would not have started to write it if I hadn't been writing Buffy fanfic. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of, yeah it was kind of just it got me back into like the fun of writing fiction because I'd been writing a lot of poetry up to that point and some me- and like memoir. This yeah it really got me back into into fiction and just enjoying myself. Um, yeah so I wrote a lot of Buffy fic and I, I then I wrote a little bit of Doctor Who fic and then I was just kind of done. But it was definitely, it was an inspiring thing for me. It definitely, I think it really, it um, influenced my fiction writing, doing that for a few years. Yeah, I think it does a lot of people. And I think people are starting to take fan fiction more seriously now, even if they're not saying, let's just file off the the informational numbers. What is it? Serial numbers. It's file off the serial numbers is the phrase. You know, they want to say, file off the serial numbers and then submit it elsewhere as your new thing. But just people go in there to find good writers. And even if you're not making up every single facet of your story, if you're taking something from a fandom, you st- it's still clear who is a strong writer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just think that's very exciting and terrifying because I know some people might just go there to write whatever the crap they want. I guess that's why people have pseudonyms over there. I have friends who I know write fanfic, but only do so under a pseudonym. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so let, let's go a little bit into your poetry, because I was kind of uh, looking into that. And it's really funny because you've got a poem, uh, Dear Tom Cassidy's Daughter, from uh, Strange Horizons, April 2023. And my kid and I had just watched Psycho, like, oh, last yeah. week or something. Uh-huh. And so all of, I I didn't remember the name, I didn't remember the name Tom Cassidy, but I was reading the poem. And um, for for those of you who don't know or don't remember, Tom Cassidy is the guy that Marion steals the money from. And he's the one bragging about his daughter getting married soon. And that money is going to go to her. And uh, that's the last we hear of either of those characters, except for maybe he, maybe he wants to forgive the debt if she comes back kind of thing. He, yeah, he he he's buying her a house for a wedding present. His 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 like eighteen year old daughter. Right. And yeah, I don't I don't think the, the, his name kind of just flies right by. I just I when I was going to write the poem, I looked it up online. Um, but yes, I just it was a fun little germ. It's like, well, what about these people who are like kind of tangential to like this murder spree? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, <laughs> and, and, yeah. Go ahead. What would it be like to be like that girl getting married and, you know, having this murder spree going mm-hmm. on, you know, that was touched off by the fact that you got married and your dad bought you a wedding present? Yeah, or couldn't buy you the wedding present because Marion. Well, I think the guy was probably loaded enough that yeah. he, he, he had more more money. And he's carrying around 40000 in cash, so he was... Yeah. He's probably yeah, okay. you know, I don't know. You know, they did at the end of the movie. Of course, they they do pull up the car. I'm oh, thinking that's maybe right. he, did, he probably did get the money back. Maybe it was waterlogged or whatever. But I think he yeah. probably does get the money eventually. Yeah. Anyway, um, so what? What I this is the kind of writing that I do, not poetry. I'm not good at poetry at all. But the what about this little detail over here that no one's talking about? And so. That's why I liked this so much. So what can, can you tell us what triggered this idea or where what what made you want to write for Tom Cassidy's daughter? Well, I I, I rewatch favorite movies a lot. I mean, I'm like a TCM mm-hmm. freak and, and like there are certain movies that if they're on, even though I've seen them a million times, I'm going to get sucked back in. And Psycho is definitely one of them. And I, I mean, I think probably I was just watching it and. And yeah, I just, that little detail must have just piqued my interest. Often, like if I'm going to write about a movie that I love, I I won't want to like write about the whole movie. I mean, there's just so much, in a classic film, there's just so much Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's fun to sometimes just kind of approach it in that kind of sidelong way. Yeah. And just, yeah, and see where it takes, see where it takes me. So, uh, like I said, I, I don't do poetry. I admire poets so much because I just don't think that way. So as you do write short stories, 
when do you decide something is a poem and when do you decide you need to flesh it out a little bit more to a short story? Sometimes I, I, I'll start in one form and then figure out it should be another. And actually, um, A Wild Patience, you know, which was inspired by the Stepford Wives, mm -hmm. had I had written a poem um, called Misogyny that was also published in Strange Horizons some time before. And it was, I mean, it's about also about the Stepford Wives. Um, and it's and it's basically about. But I mean, it was actually about the movie as opposed to like me creating a whole new world with a different kind of robot wife. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, the poem was about like, how do the, when the kids grow up, how do they find out that their mothers have been replaced by robots? And like, surely that must be an awkward conversation, you know, between the dads and these and these kids. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my the poem. And then it just kind of didn't let me go, I guess. So then I, I was like, well, maybe I could write write fiction about that, that subject, but, you know, just take it in a different direction, which right. is what I did. So, yeah, sometimes I don't know. I, I'll start in, in a, as a poem and then it'll turn into a story or the other way around happens sometimes, too. Would you say you enjoy poetry or short story more? They're very different. Um, I would like to say that poetry, you know, is quicker and less work, but I've actually been writing a poem right now and it's gone through, I think it's gone through at least 10 drafts. Um, <laughs> wow. it could take me a while to, you know, I, for, I forget cause I don't, I don't write poems all that often compared to, to as often as I used to. So I forget how much work actually does go into them yeah. for me a lot of the time, but I mean, poetry is great. I mean, it's, I mean, in a way, it, it is it is very freeing because, you know, you don't have to deal with description and you don't have to deal with, you know, place, which is the thing that I find so mm, hard. Yeah. Um, there's just, yeah, you can, it is a very free, much freer kind of way of writing, but st but every every syllable has to be exactly right. Yeah. So, so that's the other side of it. Yeah, yeah. Description and wordsmithing is not my thing. So it's like, that's why poems scare the crap out of me, because I just, I don't write beautiful language. Um, well, you know, I, I think of my, my prose as not being particularly rococo or beautiful. It's, I think it's more leans towards the transparent end. So it's fun with poetry to really kind of get down into the sound of the of the words. Mm -hmm. um, and even in poetry, I'm not, you know, a lot of poets are very into images. I'm much more into the sound. Yeah. Sound, sound of it than I am the, uh, the, 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 the imagery. I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's, you're not flowery, but you still pick the right words. I mean, did you think of how your father's moolah sped her way to death, appalled cello half notes, descending like Mary and sliding down the wall? I mean, you've got like several words for money in this poem itself. And <laughs> it's just, I well, just Well, it really... was fun to, get to, fun to get to use the word moolah for yeah. the first time. <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, that reminds me, I did a lot of research on, on the piece of music. That oh, plays. really? Yeah, when when Janet Lee is getting stabbed, um, and and so that was a whole other fascinating thing. And and like then how do you describe you know how do you describe you know Bernard Herman's Herman's you know music? So yeah, that was that I think that was something that I had always wanted to get into, you know, cause that very impressive music. Yeah, because you know, um, side note in in you know the credit the opening credit sequence to psycho it always thrills me because bernard herman you know who the composer gets the second credit he gets the credit right before hitchcock hitchcock wow because hitchcock clearly realized the movie would have been nothing without that score yeah so it's like i always am just it just makes me so happy to see that acknowledged yeah that's really cool i didn't know it was cellos uh, yeah, yeah, my violin teacher has shown me how. Well, he not didn't teach me how, but he 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 could make the sounds on his violin. But um, yeah, that's very cool. 
But we're not here to talk about Psycho. Just your poem about Psycho is really awesome, and I love it. Um, are there any poetry? Is, is are there any poems in your short story collection, or is it all no, short stories? Um, well, my my I had an earlier collection with Aqueduct called People Change, and it was half poetry and half fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like that collection a lot. But <laughs> I mean, one thing about it is, I feel that you know a short fiction collection is going to get a different kind of attention mm -hmm. than something with poetry in it. And it's like, there are many, I mean, not that I've, I've been nominated for awards, but like, you can't submit your work. You can't like submit a half and half book to a lot of awards. I see. That you yeah. Can't, that you can if it's one or the other. So I mean, actually a friend of mine said that to me when I was putting together that book, she was like, you know, you can't, you know, you won't be able to submit yeah that stuff, you know? and i was like oh whatever um but but i kind of said to myself well when i do another collection i will do one that's one or the other and i am kind of putting together a book uh, like a, a chat book of of more recent poetry as well mm -hmm. so yeah um i'm not sorry i did it the way that i did with 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 that earlier book but I, it just it made a certain sense to me to do just 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 the one or the other. Right. Um. Sorry. I lost my train of thought. That happens sometimes. So, uh, what can you tell us about the book that you just finished, if anything? And if you want to say nothing, that's fine too. I know some people don't like to talk about that. It is a book about well. I finished the first draft before Roe v. Wade was destroyed, mm -hmm. and it's all about bodily autonomy and pregnancy and abortion. Mm -hmm. And but it's through a through a supernatural through a supernatural yeah. kind of a it's a it's a fan it's it's kind of fantasy. I mean, I call it literary fantasy, but again, my work is not super flowery, mm -hmm. but but it's very grounded fantasy. It's set during the during um, George W. Bush's second term. Okay, and um, and it's long, which I think may be a problem. Yeah, <laughs> but I I mean it's supposed to be in the length that fantasy is allowed to be. Yeah, but I but I gather publishers are liking things to be shorter these days although some of my most favorite recent things have been quite long longer than than this book um and and also i i mean i thought when when roe v wade was was canceled i thought well gosh i wish this book wasn't so relevant mm -hmm. um and i thought that there would be interest because of that, but I'm wondering if maybe some agents are shying away <laughs> because they don't, you know, they don't want, they don't want this stuff in, you know, they want escapism. They don't want to have to deal with this stuff in their fantasy. I don't know. Emily Tesh won the Hugo this past year. And I believe, uh, her book was sadly relevant. So mm -hmm. I don't remember the name of it, but, um, so I don't know. Yeah. I'm very, no, no. I'm just very give it a try, book, but, but we will see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you use the phrase grounded fantasy. What do you mean by that? Yeah. It, um, basically it's, I guess it's kind of what they used to call urban fantasy, but urban fantasy has certain very specific connotations, just fantasy that's set in our world. Okay. Um, as opposed to secondary world fantasy. Okay. I mean, there, there are fantasy elements. It. I mean, there's like, one of the main characters is kind of a guardian angel, but, but not in a religious way. Um, and, um, and there's some stuff about witches, but there isn't like a whole like other magical world that we see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Urban fantasy kind of ties you into usually some sort of uh, femme monster hunter. Yeah. Yeah. Who right. Falls in love with whatever she's hunting. Yeah. Yeah, this is this this one. The I, there is a lot of magical stuff, but it kind of creeps in. It doesn't. You when you start out, if you didn't know it was a fantasy book, you might just assume it was going to be kind of straight literary fiction. Mm -hmm. 
Did, um, yeah, how do you feel, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you feel about uh, book covers conveying the story very well? Because like you just said, if it, if it feels a little bit too much like um, literary, then if it starts out too much like literary, you want people to know that there might be some sort of fantastical element. Would you lean on marketing or uh, cover design for that? Yeah, I guess, I guess so. Um, I mean, I would certainly, yeah, I would, I mean, I would assume that on that, like the bat cover copy would, would spoil the fact that there's magical stuff. True. Um, well, like, um, there was a book a few years ago called the Pisces, mm -hmm. um, which is about a woman who she's going through all kinds of real life stuff. And then she meets a merman and like has an affair with this, with this merman. And I swear it, it takes like a hundred pages before <laughs> he, before he shows up. And, and then, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I like. And I mean, it's the kind of thing I kind of did in my book, but even I was kind of like, you know, bring on the merman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, I mean, cause the back cover is like, you know, this book is about this woman who meets a merman and, mm -hmm. and, and kind of says in maybe a paragraph or maybe a sentence or two, the stuff that happens like in the first hundred pages of the book. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I definitely would not have picked up the book if it was just that other stuff mm -hmm. that kind of leads into, leads into the merman. Yeah. But merman is the hook, right? Yeah, right. Uh, someone in, uh, under Pope in chat says, I missed something with grounded fantasy, a term used by the agent or publisher, which is a good question. Is that something is actually under Pope? Uh, Gwen used it. But uh, is that something you've heard other people throw about? It, it's definitely something a, a, agents use nowadays. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it was back when I was querying back in the day. Mm hmm. There are a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of jargon that, that has changed. Yeah, I, I have yet to see an agent say the word romanticy without a slight wince. <laughs> they just... A lot of a lot of them want, want it, though. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I mean, and there is a lot of romance in my novel, the one that I just wrote, and but and yet I don't think my book is romanticy. I mean, I just, again, I feel like there are certain things that that, that, that implies... Yeah. Well, I think romance is the, um, if you say your book is a romance, then you need to follow the rules of romance, usually meaning happy ever after or happy for now. So if your book has love and romance in it, but that's not the focus and that's not their ending, then that probably doesn't fall in that genre, at least how I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my book is actually kind of inadvertently structured like a romance. Um, <laughs> and yet, I mean, that's kind of not what I was setting out to do, but the ro I mean, the characters kind of had other ideas so, than what I, sorry. what I originally thought was going to happen. So are you a, a discovery writer? Yes. 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 This book, I, I had very different ideas about this book when it started. And actually I had tried to write it some years before. And I just like was like, no, I'm not going to keep going because I don't know what I'm doing and something is wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I just put it aside. Um, and then I started it again. And then the characters just sort of took off in this other direction. And I never didn't have to go back and, and change things because they I mean, it was always stuff that was kind of 50, 100 pages later mm -hmm. that, that they were like, do it this way instead of this way. And so, so yeah, it, I, it was definitely, there was a lot of discovery. Yeah. But it, I mean, it worked out, it turned out great. I think, I mean, I, I had to do a lot of revision, but it wasn't, it wasn't that I had to, I didn't have to change like the earlier parts because I had changed my conception. It just worked because the characters were the characters. Mm -hmm. How do you approach uh, the editorial process? Cause that's my least favorite spot, uh, part of writing. Well, um, I have a friend um, who is my beta reader, and for this book, I um, and for earlier things I've written too, I'll, I'll once I'm ready 
to revise, I, um, I'll send it to her chapter by chapter. Like I'll, I'll revise a chapter and send it to her and just go through the whole book that way. Um, and, uh, and I showed it to a couple of other people. Um, I mean, with books that I've had published, you know, I've, I've worked with um, the editors at Aqueduct and yeah, it's, it's, I enjoy it. I mean, you know, I mean, a lot of the, I, it's like, I know my weak, I know my weaknesses. Um, you know, I don't need someone to tell me you need to describe that room. <laughs> yeah. Uh, things like that. You know, when I, when I, when I get into the revision, I know, I know the task at hand for the most part. I mean, there are definitely things that like my friend or other people will tell me, you know, doesn't work, but nine times out of 10, it's stuff that I deep down, I really know. Yeah. Um, so is there anything uh, you want to talk about that I haven't asked you? Um, well, I guess I could just mention Aqueduct Press. I mean, this is my third book with them mm -hmm. and they are a really wonderful small press. They, they publish just, I mean, if you just look at their catalog, they've published a lot of incredible stuff and they published some things by authors who have later gone on, you know, like, like Andrea Harrison is now with, publishes with Tor, I believe, and they, they actually reprinted some of Aqueduct's books. Um, I, th I think, I think Tor picked, picked those books up. And I know that, you know, they really, the editors at Aqueduct just love that when, when, you know, their authors, you know, make it to, to the larger presses. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, um, a novella called to the woman in the pink hat, I believe it just won a Shirley Jackson award. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was cool. I was in the room when it happened at ReaderCon, <laughs> so that was exciting. That's very exciting. Um, yeah. You did mention going to ReaderCon. Uh, now that people are relaxing a tad bit, depending on who you talk to, about. Uh, infection rates and everything um what what cons do you usually like to go to um well pre-covid um i always went to wiscon and ReaderCon, um and occasionally i go to a larger convention um wiscon is going through kind of a reshuffle right now i right. think they're only wow. doing online next year i actually oh, wow. did get covid i got covid at ReaderCon this year even oh, no. though they, they do have pretty good mitigation stuff but i'll i'll still go back um i really like reader con so yeah i'll probably go back there next year um oh and i went to i went to the nebulas this year because it was in la mm -hmm. it was in pasadena which is cl quite close to me um i had done online before but I, this is the first time i'd gone in person and i really enjoyed that so depending on where they are next year i might go back there okay I was hoping I would know that offhand, but I don't, where the nebulas are going to be. Uh, we have a question in chat. Under Pope asked, how are you going about finding a new agent? I'm starting that process soon, and I am filled with fear. <laughs> um, well, there is a lot of great information out there now that there didn't used to be back the, when I did my search before. I mean, um, you know, many agents post their wish lists online. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's query um query tracker i i subscribe to that now um which gives you a lot of information mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's great in a way in another way it can be a little irritating because you get these very detailed wish lists <laughs> and it's like i'd be like oh yes this this and this and then oh but i don't want anything about you know this other random thing. Yeah. And, and sometimes they seem awfully arbitrary because I'm like, well, isn't your job to like sell things and maybe you would have a wide, you know, you, you would have a, a some kind of wide taste. Yeah. And, I mean, sometimes it seems like these are the things that I personally enjoy and they are what I'm, what I want to represent. Um, and then other agents are, are, do not do that at all. But yeah, it's, it's, I find it a little odd at times, just the granularity of, of, of 
some th- some of the wealth of information that is now out there. Yeah. But but it is I mean there are so many agents so it's helpful to be like oh this agent likes grounded fantasy or this agent you know hates these other things so I won't bo- I won't bother with them. Um but yes I so yeah I I subscribe to 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 um query tracker and I and I look at the wish lists when when they're out there and even though I try not to be on Twitter very much yeah there's still a lot of agents are on Twitter and they they announce when they're opening and closing and they announce like updated wish lists so I still go on there I did try um there's a lot of of um pitch events that are mm-hmm. still on Twitter which you know, I don't want to do that now with the AI thing happening on Twitter, but I know a lot of people do them. I've not had luck with them, but I found them kind of useful just in terms of honing my pitch. Yeah. Just just kind of learning how to write a good pitch, which I found very challenging. Yeah. So it was useful for me just in that regard, just kind of for my own learning. Yeah, I was going to ask if they still do pitch events over there, but uh, they do. They do. I, wow. I think some, some, some of them are trying to find other homes for their pitch events. Mm-hmm. But there's one happening today. Um, so yeah, they're they're still happening. Um, seems to me mostly like really the people who do those are like kind of newer authors, people who have not had things published or has have not had agents in the past um do them and they they put together like mood boards and you know like graphics to go with their pitches and things like that it's kind of a different world wow. that i'm used to yeah yeah i know a lot of people like try to find pictures of their like who they have who their characters are in their head yeah yeah and uh i've done that once and it didn't really do a lot for me it wasn't bad yeah. it just wasn't like yeah so I, I yes yeah it just it kind of isn't where I'm at but I think but it definitely works for some people and I I mean I know some people have had success mm-hmm. with those pitch events and their their you know the artwork and things like that yeah what confuses me about um, querying is a lot of times they'll cite something that's totally fixable. Like, if that's the only reason you don't want this book, I can easily lift it out. But mm-hmm. no, it's instead of a revise and resubmit, they're just like, nope, we're good. And that's, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I still get that. And it's frustrating. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's 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 still a, a magic maze out there of of why they, well, they choose what they do. I, I do find, though, I mean, there were, I did try... After I parted ways with my agent, I tried to, to get an agent for Can't Find My Way Home, which I ended up selling myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I get actually a lot more response now. I mean, they're rejections, but still, I, I get more more replies than yeah. I was getting the last time that I tried. Um because now so many people are on Query Manager, so there's like kind of an automated system. I think that 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 encourages them in a way to actually clear out their queues. Yeah. Um, in a way that did not happen when everyone was still just doing it through their their emails. So that's nice. It's nice because it was frustrating to just get a lot of crickets. Yeah. It's nice to at least get responses. Yeah. Um, Well, what is your advice to beginning writers, either in the poetry or short story or noveling field or just writing in general? Well, you know, just persistence, persistence, persistence. Um, And I mean, you know, in terms of writing and in terms of publishing, you know, I have published things like I I have a story that was published in fantasy magazine, you know, which was a pro zine that I think had been um, rejected at least 20 times, maybe more like all up and down the spectrum. You know, I started with, Mm -hmm. with pro zines, worked my way down. Then there were new pro zines. So then I, you know, then I subbed to them. Yeah. You just, you just never know. Yeah. But, but you do know if you stop trying, then nothing's going to (laughs) happen. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, well, where can we find you online, Gwen? Um, I have a website, gwengarfinkel.com. Um, I am on Blue Sky, um, Gwenga, um, however, whatever that long string <laughs> is on Blue oh, Sky. Oh, yeah, Blue Sky is kind of a mess still. So. But I really, but I enjoy Blue Sky a lot, and especially since the latest um, AI thing on Twitter, a lot more authors are flocking to Blue Sky. So that's so it's actually a pretty cool space now. Do um, I want to know the latest AI thing on Twitter? Oh, that they're allowing them to harvest everything, like yeah. everyone's tweets, and you can't basically. opt out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, but but um and uh dream with but but blue sky is cool and uh, yeah I, I i recommend it now because you know at first it was very tiny but now you know it's starting to burgeon you know for various reasons one one because it's it's fun and also because of twitter being so hor horrifying yeah <laughs> yeah uh well thank you so much for being on the show gwen um Thanks, if you guys want to get in touch with me mightymer at gmail.com is the best way to do it you can find my blog and show notes at merverse.com and you can see us record live on twitch thursday afternoons 3 p.m eastern time and uh that's twitch.tv slash mighty um i'm still working on my stream schedule and so i kind of i'll figure it out someday Appreciate your patience, but uh, I'll see you guys next week, and until then, you should be writing. Thank you for listening to I Should Be Writing, the longest-running writing podcast in existence. This episode was made possible by the Fabulous, who support the podcast via Patreon or Substack. Join the Fabulous at patreon.com slash mightymer or mightymer.substack.com. Theme music provided by John Anilio. Art provided by Numbers Ninja, and podcast hosting provided by Libsyn. This episode is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 License. You can find all of my books and podcasts at merverse.com. Doctor Who